Get Wisdom is the title of our next teaching in this series in looking at the book of Proverbs. So we're looking at Proverbs chapter 4 this evening and I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So fundamentally what we've established is that the book of Proverbs is primarily a message to Israel about the last days. So its audience is Israel and specifically it's speaking about the last days and we note the two ways the way of righteousness and the way of wickedness which will come out again in Proverbs 4 as we see the word way mentioned another three times as we follow through. So if you can turn to Proverbs chapter 4 verse 1 it tells us there hear he children and instruction of a father and attend to know understanding. In our first part Series 1, Episode 1, which we looked at, it was titled, To Know Wisdom. Here it opens up in verse 1 of chapter 4 and says, To Know Understanding. We know that understanding to this point, we've learned that understanding is the pinnacle of the seven instructions that are given from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, 3 and 4. Wisdom and knowledge and discretion, along with subtlety, and equity and judgment and justice those seven things are instructions and those seven instructions if you follow them accordingly you will ultimately receive understanding we've mentioned scriptures before we passed Proverbs 9 10 comes to mind where it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and they that have the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding so understanding comes with the knowledge of the Holy or the Holy One. In Job 32 8, it says to us, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth forth understanding. So our understanding comes from the inspiration of the Almighty, the in spirit of the Almighty, the inspiration. The word inspiration, I've told you before, but I'll mention again, is mentioned only twice in the King James Bible. First time in Job 32 8, and the last time it's mentioned is in 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 which tells us all scripture is inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine which we'll get to in verse 2 in a moment. Reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if we look at verse 1 it says here, Hear ye children. So up to now, beginning of chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Proverbs, it says my son, my son. That my son comes through another twice more here in chapter 4 which I'll indicate to when we get to verse 10 but here it says he children so looking at the nation of Israel corporately together as a nation he children and it's given the instruction of the father remember God the father our father as Jesus Christ taught his disciples the Lord's prayer which is a prayer for Israel particularly through the tribulation and they need to attend to know and I'm more on the word to attend in a moment which we've covered already but just to remind you verse 2 for I give you good doctrine forsake ye not my law I give you good doctrine why because it's good doctrine for the last day the last days for Israel our doctrine is within the bounds of Romans to Philemon remember Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 7 Consider what I say and the Lord gives you understanding. Paul wrote 13 books from Romans to Philemon. If you look at the book that precedes the book of Romans, the book of Acts, Acts in Acts 2, Peter says to Israel, his audience, he says these are the last days which the prophet Joel spoke about. If you go to the book that follows the book of Philemon, after Paul's writings, it's the book of Hebrews. Hebrews opens up in Hebrews 1.1 and it says in sundry times, and in Divis man of God, who in the same time as Divis man has spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has made heir of all things. So Acts speaks about the last days. Hebrews speaks about the last days. We are in this conduit period. We are in this parenthesis period, which is called, according to Ephesians 3, 2, the dispensation of grace. Where God is not dealing with prophecy in Israel, He's dealing with the body of Christ and the church. If you look at 
Ephesians 1, uh, 22, 23, which says the church, which is his body. And that's separate to Israel, which is his bride. So he's dealing with the body of Christ during the out dispensation of grace. He's not dealing with prophecy. The prophetic calendar of Israel is on hold at the stoning of Stephen. And God has migrated across to Paul and with his gospel message. And when we are relieved, when we are raptured at the end of the dispensation of grace, then God goes back to dealing with Israel and the Jew. So the, the doctrine for Israel is essentially the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is the milk gospel and the meat for Israel are Hebrews to Revelation. Those last nine books of the New Testament are not written to the body of Christ. There are actually four Israel. If you look at my past Bible studies, Paul's epistles and the Hebrew epistles, it dissects them for you so you can know what is for the body of Christ today and what is for Israel tomorrow. The ages to come. The Hebrews to Revelation books. If you're following any teacher that is either teaching you from the Gospels or from Hebrews to Revelation and telling you that's for the body of Christ, then he's teaching you incorrectly. You are receiving the wrong message for our day. Verse 3. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved, in the sight of my mother. So this is speaking of Solomon. We know from 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 25 when Samuel was named uh, Samson was named Samson I believe I should have said Samson if I said Samuel I apologize Samson was of the Lord by the prophet Nathan was called Jediah and that means beloved of the Lord and then he's particularly mentioned in 2 Samuel 2 Samuel 12 25 but it's speaking of King Solomon that's why I'm getting confused because it's from Samuel Verse 4, he taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. So there, need, you need to be a, there needs to be a retention of the word of God. Keep the commandments and live. The commandments, instruction to Israel is to keep the commandments. Ours is grace, where the Lord gives us grace in this dispensation. But to Israel, they need to keep the commandments. They need to be a... They need to retain it, the retention. So they went through the Torah annually. They begin at the, at the beginning and end. And they would go through it reading after reading to retain. And they would pass this down from generation to generation as early Joel tells us. Joel chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. Teach your children. And so it would be followed. There was this retention. If you want to recite scripture you need to retain it you need to go over it over it and over it so you don't forget it we like a man that looks in the mirror the book of james tells us and as soon as we take our eyes off that mirror we forget what we look like so we need to retain the words of god now in verse 5 it begins with get wisdom this is the title of our message here today chapter 4 is get wisdom last week we looked at finding wisdom this is getting wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. We'll touch on that in a moment in verse 7. But get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline the words from thy mouth. So our mouths need to be filled with the word of the Lord. Remember Jesus Christ said that man cannot live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we need to put the Lord's words in our mouth. Again, worth mentioning, but in our dispensation, Consider what I say, the Lord gives the understanding. 2 Timothy 2 7, we need to consider what those 13 epistles in Paul's writings to us, because he is the apostle to the Gentiles, Romans 11 9, 13. And we need to take cognizance of what he is telling us. Out, outside of that, it's for Israel. So you need to rightly dissect and rightly divide what is the word of truth according to 2 Timothy 2.15 and then it goes on and tells us here in verse 6 now verse 6 and verse 8 goes together verse 5 and verse 7 go together so perhaps let's just do verse 7 come back to verse 6 verse 7 says wisdom is the principal thing 
get wisdom, but in all you're getting, get understanding. So we've already covered it before in past lessons, where understanding is the pinnacle of the seven instructions as given by God. Wisdom is just a component. So is knowledge and discretion. All those things are components. The pinnacle of them is understanding. You'll know you have understanding if you can understand that the New Testament is divided with Israel past, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the book of Acts, that is past doctrine. You've got Romans to Philemon, which is the back now doctrine of our day. And then after we have gone, you've got Hebrews to Revelation, which is the ages to come doctrine of Israel to come. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses particularly verses 11, verses 13 and verses 7, verses 11 speaks about time past. Verses 13 speaks about but now, and verse 7 speaks about ages to come. So the book of Ephesians 2 speaks about those three different periods. So it's the pinnacle understanding. So let's go back to verse 6 and verse 8. We yoke them together. Verse 6 says, forsake or not. Speaking about wisdom, remember the title of the message is get wisdom. As it's told to us in verse 5, get wisdom. So it says, forsake or not. Once you get wisdom, you forsake or not. You can think about this as regards to your spouse. Forsake her not. And she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. So you have forsake her not, you have love her. So as a man loves a woman, I sound like Percy Sledge, but as a man loves a woman, so we ought to love wisdom. We ought to forsake her not. And we ought to love her. And then in verse 8, it adds two more on and it says that exalt her. We need to exalt wisdom. And she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. It was a famous salesman, Raymond Ackerman, that said, If you treat your wife like a queen, she will make you king. And so it is with wisdom. If you treat wisdom like a queen and you forsake her not, and you love her, and you exalt her, and you embrace wisdom, then she will make you a king among your peers, because you possess wisdom, and you'll be on your way to receiving understanding, which is the pinnacle, as I've mentioned. Verse 9, it tells us, She shall give to thee thy head an ornament of grace, and a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. So again, these tangible things, an ornament of grace and a crown of glory, these tangible things are actually intangible things because wisdom is something that you can't see. You don't know who has wisdom and who has not. Many heard that King Solomon had wisdom and they came from afar like the Queen um, Sheba from Ethiopia. She traveled afar because... His wisdom was notorious. So, this is again expounding on Proverbs 1.9, where we touched on this, and Proverbs 3.22, which we touched last week, on a crown of, right, of glory and, a, and an ornament of grace. So, we need to be adorned, not with jewelry and raiment, and this is what Peter touched on in 1 Peter 3, but we need to be adorned with um, these intangible things of wisdom and knowledge and discretion, of equity and subtlety, justice and judgment, culminating in the pinnacle, which is understanding. We go on to verse 10. and verse 10, you'll, there's a break here where it says, Hear, O my son. Remember the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1, my son. And chapter 3, my son, verse 1. Now again, you've got your verse 10 of chapter 4, my son. Receive my sayings, and the years of my life shall be many. Remember of the Ten Commandments, the fifth commandment was obey your parents. And it came with the promise, which was long life. And here you see the years of your life shall be many. It's fulfilling the promise, the prophesied promise from Exodus chapter 20 verse 12, speaking about the Ten Commandments. Remember the first four commandments was man's relationship with God. The fifth commandment was man's relationship with his parents. And then the last five commandments was man's relationship with man. And ultimately, obeying your parents is obeying God because God is the Father 
Wisdom is likened as to the mother. She culminates at the end in Proverbs chapter 31 as this virtuous woman. But in verse 11 it goes on and says, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. The word way is mentioned here in the seventh time in the book of Proverbs. And it's mentioned as the way of wisdom. And that is the way that we ought to follow. More than that in a moment. I have led thee in the right paths. So the way of wisdom is the right paths. We touched on Psalm 16, 11 last week where it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand of pleasures forevermore. So the right path is the path of life. Which is the way of wisdom. If you follow the way of wisdom, she will lead you along the right path, ultimately to the path of life. And there you have the presence of God, which is forevermore, and He's by His right hand of pleasures. So they all culminate and they just give you and to show you the, the way of path, the way of wisdom, what it is, it's the right path. Moving on, it says, When thou goest, thy steps shall be not straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Now, the steps, we mentioned the steps already in Proverbs, I beg your pardon, Psalm 37, 13. Where Psalm 37, 23, I beg your pardon, says, The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. You know from Proverbs 16, 9, where it says, Man devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. They are directed by the Lord. Psalm 37, 23. But man connives. Man finds a way. Man takes shortcuts. Man manipulates. So he manipulates, connives his way, whereas the Lord directs the steps. So we need to ask the Lord that He would direct our steps along the right path, along the way of wisdom, so ultimately we can receive the path of life. And it says that thou shalt not stumble. We remember in Psalm 40 verse 30 where it says, And young men shall faint and be weary. And youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. So those that trust in the Lord, their strength shall be renewed. As Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He renews our strength. Galatians 6.9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, but in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Proverbs 24.10 If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So we need to have the strength from the Lord. The strength of the inner man. Ephesians. There's two prayers in Ephesians. Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4. It's about praying about the inner man. Strengthening this inner man. This treasure that we have inside us. This power that is in us. That is strengthened for this path that is before us. This right path, this way of wisdom, the path of life. And we ought not to stumble. Young men are going to stumble. You shall stumble. Those that are not grafted into the word of God, they're going to fall, they're going to stumble, they're going to faint. The journey is going to be too long for them. But those that are tapped into the Holy Spirit, remember the Lord said, it's not by mind, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, so say the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, 6, we need to be tapped into the Lord of hosts and He will give us the strength for the day which is at hand. So many stumble. We touched on stumble last week. Proverbs 3.23. So don't stumble. We move on and says verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. Remember those seven instructions which touched on already. Let not her go. Keep her for she is thy life. So you need to take false fast hold of instruction and the instruction were those seven things the knowledge, the wisdom, the discretion, the subtlety the equity, the judgment, the justice take hold of instruction don't let her go because they're going to lead you to the path of life 
which is the right path, which is the way of wisdom. Keep her and she is thy life. The path of life. She is thy life. Verse 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. So way here is mentioned for the eighth time. And you'll notice it's contrasted to the way of wisdom. Here you have the way of the wicked. The way of evil men. The path of the wicked. You have the path of life. Now you've got the path of the wicked. Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 he said there are two ways. There is the straight, narrow, straight is the gate and few that find it. And he says broad is the way and many that go down which leadeth to damnation, which leadeth to destruction, which is the evil way, the wicked way. So you need to differentiate and you need to know the path that you are, the, the way of wisdom, the path of life. The right path. Verse 15. Avoid it and pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. I'm reminded when Elisha told his servant Gehazi to go to that boy that had died and to take his crook, to take his staff, and to lay it upon the boy until he gets there. And he said to him, if anybody greets you, greet them not. In other words, you need to stay focused. You need to stay on the path. Don't be diverted. We're going to get more on this towards the end when we get to verse 25 and 26 in the same passage. So, pass not by. Pass away. Turn from it. The way of the wicked. Don't find yourself in the broad way. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't necessarily make it right. Be careful of the modern trends of the day. That are leading on this broad way, on this acceptance, on this woke. Just because thousands are doing it doesn't make it right. Follow the way of wisdom, the way of truth, the way of God. The right way, the right path. That's the way you want to be. Even if you're the minority, rather be the minority with God than the majority on the wrong path. Because that's what it's telling us. Broad is the way. And many that go down there. Because they are, they're not following wisdom. They're not following truth. Um, verse 16 says, For they sleep not. Now, I touched on this last week, if I have my place here, in Psalm 127 verse 2, where it says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. So we see sleep is given to the beloved. The word beloved coming up again. Remember, that was the name that God gave to King Solomon when he was born at the time of Nathan coming there in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 25. So here we see they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away from them unless they cause some to fall. Remember, many shall stumble, many shall fall, many shall grow weary, many shall faint and their sleep is taken away from them. Many are on narcotics, they're on drugs. In our area, they're on tech and they can't sleep at night. So they walk in the streets at 2, 3 in the morning when you should be sleeping, having beauty sleep from the Lord, as mentioned to us in Psalm 127, verse 2. Their sleep is taken from them and they're getting up to mischief. They're doing all sorts of things at night time, like zombies. They're walking zombies. Verse 17 For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Now, the bread and wine are primarily always associated with the communion of Jesus Christ, the Last Supper, the bread, these are my body, the wine, drink of my blood. This is the communion of God. We need to all be communion with the Lord. However, here we see that they are in communion with wickedness and with violence. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 warns about this. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, with infidels. What has light to do with darkness and concord with Christ and Bilal? So be careful who you're dating. Make sure they're equally yoked with you with regard to spiritual matters. Your friends, be careful of being in fellowship with people that are unrighteous, that are ungodly, that are communion in wickedness. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
Birds of a feather flock together. So a bird is known by its song. So a man by the company he chooses. So be careful being caught up with the, because you'll end up eating of the bread of wickedness and drinking of the wine of violence. So instead of having the bread and the wine as communion, as the remembrance of the Lord and remembering what He did for us on the cross and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So they are caught up, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in the things of Bilal and the infidels and the unrighteousness. So be careful who you are in business with, who you are in fellowship with, who your friend circle with. You the average sum, according to Jim Rohn, you the average sum of your five closest friends. Look at your five closest friends. What are they up to? Because that shows you a little bit of who you are. So judge your own self. Use discretion to judge your own self and your own matters. Discretion is the art of being able to judge on your own self without going to the multitude of counselors. Judge your own self. Weigh your own self. Look at your own heart and determine who you are in the Lord. Remember in 2 Kings chapter 6, 27, when the woman came to the Lord, he said to her, How can I help you? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? The barn floor is the bread. The wine press is the wine. The bread symbolic of the word of God. The wine symbolic of the spirit of God. So how can I help you? Um, do you want a word from the Lord? Or do you want a touch of the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord? Those are the two areas. Somebody can pray for you, or somebody can give you a word from the Lord. So the word of the Lord is how He eats, what is ingested into us. As we breathe in the word, we breathe out. That is prayer. So how we are anointed. So you can tell a man what he's consuming with regards to the Word of God. I quoted a passage earlier which says, Jesus Christ said, No man, man cannot live by bread alone, but every word which proceeded out of the mouth of God. What's coming out of their mouth? Is it the Word of God? Is it wisdom? Is it righteousness? Is it the Spirit of God? For the Word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the right and son of the Son of the Spirit, and John Samaria, and he's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. What is coming out of their mouth? Is it the sword of the Spirit? Is it the Word of the Lord? Is it lifting you up? Is it esteeming you? Is it righteousness? Or is it the bread of wickedness and the wine of violence? What are their imaginations? What are they caught up in? What are they thinking of? What are they speaking of? We're going to get to this in a moment when we get to verse 23. It says, out of the heart come the issues of life. We'll touch on that in a moment. Verse 18. But the path of the just is as a shining light. And shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So with us, as we receive the revelation of the understanding, and in Ephesians chapter 1, it speaks about um, having your eyes enlightened to understanding, so that you'll have wisdom and knowledge in Christ. In that prayer that Paul prays. So, as the Lord approaches to us in the rapture, we should every day, day by day, become more and more, we should change from glory to glory, from faith to faith, by grace to grace, into the presence of the Lord. Now we look through a looking glass dimly, but then we shall see face to face. We shall change the shining light that shineth more and more. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we spend time in the word of God, it should become more and more Lightened around us, should be able to see more things. It contrasts here in verse 19 and says, The way of the wicked is darkness. The way being mentioned for the ninth time in the book of Proverbs. The way of the wicked is darkness. They know not at what they stumble. You, you see, during the, the time with preceding Sodom and Gomorrah, they stumbled. They couldn't find the place of Lot. Again, it's mentioned in the latter parts of the book of Judges that blindness came upon them, that they couldn't see. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 tells us that the God of this world has blinded the Gentiles. 
that the light of the glorious gospel should enter in and they should be enlightened. Even the Jews are under a mystery of blindness. So it's contrasted. The way of the wicked is they, they stumble, they fall, they faint, they grow weary. Again in verse 20 it says, My son. Remember verse 10 it said, My son. Same as chapter 3, 1 and 2, 1. My son, my son, my son. And here again, my son. Attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Now we already did to heed wisdom. A past lesson. The seven ways to heed wisdom. Which is taken from chapter 2, verses 1 and 4. So if you go back there, and it says here, attend and incline. You will notice briefly as I move along here, it says, receive, hide, incline, apply, Christ, lift us and seek. Those seven things from chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Those seven things that they needed to do to heed wisdom. So here again it's mentioning, attend to my words. You need to attend to the word of God. The Bible tells us more clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15. It says, study. To show yourself approved unto God. You can't go up on the top of a, a mountain. And sit in the lotus position. Meditate. And try and receive from the Lord. Download from the Lord. And try and sing. No you need to study the word of God. That's how we meditate. That's how we sing. Psalm 1-2 actually says. Doth thou meditate in the way. In, in the word of the Lord day and night. We need to meditate day and night in the word of the Lord. Psalm 1 verse 2. Verse 21. Let them not depart from thy eyelids. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. Heart we'll get to in a moment in verse 23. But we need to keep them in our heart. Now we already know from Jeremiah 17 9 that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know? We're going to get to that word deceitful in a moment in verse 24. But we need to not let them depart from our eyes. And this takes you back to Deuteronomy when they received the Shema, which is the most important verse to the Jews in the Bible, which was here, O Israel, the Lord thy God, thy Lord is one. Leading up to it, it tells them there that they need to write the Lord's scriptures on the, in the mezuzah, on their doorposts, um, and in their house, and on the eyelids, and in all places they used to write the will of the Lord. Ultimately, this is a prior fulfillment of what happens in the millennial kingdom. When, in, during the millennial kingdom, the Jew has, his, has the scriptures written upon his mind and upon his heart in accordance with Jeremiah 31 and Matthew 8, which is the new covenant. The Gentiles, us, we don't go in a new covenant. That's why you've got the Gentiles, Zechariah 8.23, putting the garment of one Jew saying, Teach us, for we know that God is with you. Because God is with the Jew during the millennial period, the thousand millennial period, when Jesus Christ is on the throne of David in Jerusalem, in Israel. But the Gentile, the nations, have to come up to the Jew, and the Jew needs to teach them. You don't need to teach the Jew during that period of God. They already have the gospel written on their heart and in their minds. So this is already warming them up, if you would like, and saying, Depart not the eyes from the word. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Remember the heart of the man is desperately wicked. So in that very wicked place. Most evil place in man is where the word of God needs to be. Every word. Man cannot look by bread alone. But every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Into that area. Verse 22. For they are life unto them that find them. And health to all their flesh. So they're going to have health and life. Particularly during the millennial period. When they have the word of God in them. And it'll be the fulfillment of Mark 16, where they can take up serpents and they can drink any deadly thing, etc., etc., and it's not going to bring any harm to them because they have the Holy Spirit out of the barn floor. They've got the Word of God out of the wine press. They've got the Holy Spirit in them. And that's why they've got the evidence of speaking in tongues, which is a sign unto Israel that they've got the Holy Ghost in them. For Israel, not the body of Christ. Verse 23 I touched on verse 23 in our first lesson where it said, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So the heart of man 
is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I'm reminded of Ephesians 4, 14, which says, Henceforth, we know what children tossed to and fro and move with every wind of doctrine where deceitful men lie in wait to deceive, where, where by the sight of men they lie in wait to deceive. 2 Timothy chapter 3.13 says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So you need to guard your heart, keep the heart, guard it, keep it. With all diligence, you need to be diligent about keeping your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. If you really want to know, the disciples said to Jesus that your the Pharisees said to Jesus of the disciples, their hands are not clean. What they are eating is unclean. And he said it's not what goes into the stomach that makes them unclean and what comes out of the heart. So what is in your heart comes out and it comes out from the tongue. So you need to guard your tongue. Book of James speaks about guard your tongue and guard your heart. Because out of your heart, out of your tongue, flow the issues of life. What you're really thinking is in that heart. Verse 24. Put away from the afford mouth, which is a deceitful mouth. Jeremiah 79. And perverse lips put far from thee. So instead of guarding your lips, the tongue, book of James, guard your tongue, here perverse lips. And now, verse 25, 26 and 27, I've done a past lesson on this before, a long time ago, but I was just reminded of that when I had to just conclude here. So verse 25 says, let thy eyes look right on and let thy ears, that let thy eyelids look straight before thee. So you need to, you need to have a vision. A man without a vision perishes. You need to have a vision. You need to set yourself a target. Let thy eyes look right on, and thy eyelids look straight before thee. What is your target? What is your goal? What are you aiming for? Okay, you've got the, the targeting. What are you aiming for? In Philippians 3.13, Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth for those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high corner of God in Christ Jesus. What are you aiming for? If you're aiming for wisdom, if you're aiming for Jesus Christ, then you need to make sure that you're on the path of wisdom, the right path. Isaiah 30 verse 22, I think it is, says, And he shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right, when you turn to the left. The Lord will guide you. He'll lead you. It tells us in Luke 1, 79, He's a light to them that sin in darkness and in the shadow of death. And He guides the feet in those in the way of peace. The way of of peace. I touched on Philippians 3 last week when we touched on the way of peace when it says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 speaks about the peace of God and verse 9 speaks about the God of peace. So you need to set a target. Whatever you're doing, whatever business venture you're in, whatever thing you do with a family, Whatever personal goals you have, you have to set a target. Your eyes need to look right on. You need to be focused on this target. You need to have a goal. You need to have a vision. Verse 26. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Ponder the path of the feet. How are you going to get there? What are you going to do? What do you need to do to stay on that path? It tells us there that we need to, you need to stake a path to get to the goal. I remember those guys going through the jungles. They've got like a machete and they, they cut the growth to get to where they're going. They make a path. Make a path so other, others can come along too. That's what the book of Proverbs rightly divided and dispensationally considered. As I'm teaching you, others are going to come along this path and they're going to be able to teach other people. 
David Livingston, when he came to Africa, he said, with his evangelism, that we're going to evangelize, he says, but others are going to come and they're going to reap the souls. They're going to, they're going to harvest the souls. We just come to sow the seed. Ponder the path of thy feet. If you're going to get to your goal, if you're going to aim for your vision, if you're going to make Lord God of your life, what do you need to do? Ponder your feet. What do you need to do to make that happen? And then lastly, verse 27, it says, Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy feet, thy foot from evil. Remember the, the way of wickedness. You need to remove yourself from the way of wickedness, from the broad way. The way that's leading you down the garden path. Remove yourself from that. But follow the way of wisdom. The right path. The path of life. Don't get sidetracked. Don't lose focus. Turn not to the right hand, not to the left. Know what your vision is, what your goal is. Let it be established. Ponder the path of your feet. Are you on the right way? Are you doing the right things? Are you chatting with the right people? Are you networking with the right ways? Do you have to make any drastic changes? And let the eyes look right on and the eyes look straight before thee. So this message was on get wisdom from verse 5. And you need to get wisdom and you need to stay on the way of wisdom, on the path of wisdom. And she will ultimately lead you to Christ, pressing for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's ultimately it. Because when you receive Him, He is going to give you inspiration in spirit and you're going to receive understanding, which is the pinnacle of Proverbs taken from to know wisdom, to know understanding, and to get wisdom. So, I thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in closing.